Welcome back. We are moving on now to chapter 5, which has as its theme uh, the school of British empiricism. And to start with, we're going to start with this guy Hobbes. And uh, before we really get into Hobbes, let me kind of give a little bit of cultural uh, background here. You know, I think it's safe to say that uh, culturally, uh, religiously, philosophically, um, the, the British Isles have uh, for a very long time been very different than continental Europe. And so we're going to see this perhaps is a big reason why the, the British philosophers have gone in a very different direction. So, so far up to this point we've seen a lot of rationalism, the legacy going back to the Greeks, especially Plato, but pushing through all of the, the Neoplatonism uh, as Catholicism and Christianity spread throughout continental Europe, uh, taking us up to, say, Descartes uh, as one of our kind of relatively modern uh, rationalists. And then a lot of dualism as well. Again, there was a lot of dualism implicit in a lot of the Greek philosophers like Parmenides and Pythagoras and Plato, again, suggesting appearance is not reality. We see that become a lot more explicit with Descartes, right, with his whole mind-body problem that he got into. And of course, what we saw with the mind-body problem was that if we try to persist with this idea that mind and body are different, it leads us into troubles. Descartes wanted to argue that they interacted somehow, but we saw that there was quite a bit of failure in his idea, right, that he essentially had to materialize the mind inside the pineal gland to make it all work, which violates the underlying definition of the sub, that, there, that there's two kinds of substances, stuff of mind and stuff of body. And then we saw that um, um, guys like Spinoza and Leibniz had their own ideas to try to solve the problem, but those were equally weird and problematic as well. So it seems to suggest that holding on to that kind of dualist thinking is perhaps the ultimate problem here. And so it's, but you know, we've got a couple thousand years of dualistic thinking to overcome, and that's in part why it's easier for the British philosophers to reject that, because again, they're, they're really just traditionally disconnected from continental thinking. And so it's easier for them to say, hey, let's consider monism. And this is what we'll now start with Hobbes. There were some aspects of Cartesian philosophy that Hobbes liked. He liked the mechanical side of things. So if you recall, Descartes gives us that ghost in the machine kind of issue, right, where the body is treated like a machine, a mechanism following simple hydraulic principles, whereas the mind is in there trying to control things. But if we throw away the mind and we just keep the mechanical body uh, working according to simple mechanical principles, that is a very appealing to Hobbes, and one of the reasons for that is probably because of someone like Isaac Newton. So in the same time frame, we've got Newton presenting his uh, work in physics, right? Completely revolutionizing physics and science by showing how there are simple, mathematically elegant principles that govern the movement of things in the physical world. And it's presumably then all things in the world can be explainable by Newton's uh, physics. And Hobbes thinks, hey, this is great because we can take the body and we can, we can explain bodily uh, actions in terms of Newtonian physics. And so biology and chemistry and ultimately psychology can all be explainable in Newtonian terms. And Hobbes, I think, has some sense that this is possible. So he likes the idea that there are simple cause and effect explanations to things. Right. And so he thinks that he can do the same thing when it comes to explaining the mind, that there would be a simple form of a cause and effect motion in the brain, right? not in the mind, but now in the brain. So according to Hobbes, consciousness is nothing more than an event. It's motions in the brain. This is somewhat uh, uh, reminiscent of Heraclitus when he said that you know everything is always moving, right? Motion is the essence of the universe, and it's reminiscent of even Democritus who gives us the atoms and talked about how the mind atoms move, and that's what causes consciousness. And so Hobbes, on the other hand, is, has a little more advanced knowledge about the nature of, of the brain and nerve anatomy, and he's going to now give, give us this idea that there's something happening in the brain, some kind of emotion, and that's what triggers consciousness. And further, these motions can be explainable in simple physical cause and effect terms, Newtonian physics. 
So we're seeing here what is really a monist view. In fact, it's a materialist kind of monism, right? Everything is matter, solid matter, physical. Now there's another ism here. One of the things that we sometimes still struggle with when we adopt this kind of physicalist, materialist kind of view is the idea that how do we explain the nature of consciousness in physical terms? Because consciousness itself seems to be such a non-physical kind of thing. Experience itself doesn't seem to be obviously physical in any way. And Hobbes gives us this idea, and this is an idea that still persists today, of what's called an epiphenomenon. The word phenomenon itself is, is, a, is kind of this holdover of dualist thinking because it means ghost-like in nature or ethereal. And epi kind of means above. So in this view, an epiphenomenon is mind occurs as some sort of a strange, unexplainable byproduct of nerve activity. Right? So in this view, even though consciousness emerges somehow as a byproduct of what's going on in the brain, um, and it might be somehow non-physical in some vague way, it's no longer very important because the mind is not controlling the body. The only thing that controls the body is some, some physical cause, right? Again, physical uh, physics cause and effect, those are the underlying mechanical principles that cause things to happen in the body. So the mind, if it exists as an epiphenomenon, as we say, it's just along for the ride. It's, it's experiencing what's happening in the body, but it's not otherwise controlling what's happening in the body. It's nothing more than a passive byproduct of whatever happens in the brain and body. So this is Hobbes' way of getting around the mind-body problem by suggesting that we don't have to worry about the mind anymore. We just have to worry about the physical principles that govern the behavior of the brain and nervous system and the rest of the body. So here we see also then, as Hobbes is not just a materialist, but he would also be an empiricist because we have to then address this other question. What are those causes of movements in the, the brain? And it has to be a stimulus. There has to be an external stimulus, a sensation, right? The eyes receive light that triggers a sensation in the optic nerve, which is transmitted into the brain, causing a chain reaction. The ears receive sound, which causes a vibration in the auditory nerve, and that's going to then cause a chain reaction of move movements throughout the brain. So ultimately, all of these events or movements inside the brain emerge because of sensations. So without a sensation, there is no movement in the brain, and therefore there is no consciousness. Again, this is very similar to what Democritus had said with this chain reaction of the idola to the mind atoms and so forth. So ultimately, if, if consciousness itself is, is movement in the brain, and movement in, movements in the brain can only occur in, in response to external stimulation through the senses, then what we have here is a very strong statement of empiricism. Consciousness itself is not just about the senses, it is caused by the senses. Consciousness could not exist without the senses, right? The mind exists only because there are sensations to cause it to exist. Everything that we think of is going on in the mind is ultimately reducible to a sensation. That's another ism on this slide, reductionism. Everything that's going on in the brain can be reduced to some simple thing. So when we talk about these things like consciousness and experience, these words get very difficult to nail down. They're, they're abstract and we don't know how to define them and study them, but in a reductionist view, we can eliminate that kind of complexity by stripping things down to more simple elements. And in this case, the simple element would be simple cause and effect relationships between a stimulus from the outside world and the response that occurs inside the brain. So this is also the very hint of a beginning of a stimulus response kind of psychology, which later on we're going to study in more detail, and that's going to be called behaviorism. So for here, though, on the other hand, we're just going to focus on the idea that Hobbes has this rough idea that external sensations cause movements in the brain, and that's what gives rise to consciousness. It's just a transfer of an external motion to an internal motion. There's also a hint of determinism here, because again, everything that occurs in the brain is, is, a, is an effect, and the cause is outside of the brain, right? It's in the environment. So that means all of our thoughts and feelings are caused by sensations, and so we're dealing here with determinism. No free will.
a little more on reductionism here. As I said, all consciousness, all human knowledge, all ideas in the mind boil down to perception. We can explain away other as aspects of psychological uh, experience, like memory, right? Memories are nothing more than stored sensory experiences, stored perceptions. Forgetting, you know, so reactivating a pattern of motion. If you look at a particular person's face, uh, you, this triggers a particular pattern of motion in the, in the brain. And when you recall and think about that person's face, all you're doing is you're reactivating that same pattern of motion in the brain. Forgetting would be somehow a decay of that motion pattern. The pattern fades and decays. Imagination occurs. This is where things get tricky because a lot of times we think, oh, how do, where, does, where does imagination fit into all this? How is it that we're capable of thinking about things that don't exist, things that are fictional? And you know, if you think about certain fictions like, say, a unicorn, one of the issues here is that unicorns, while they aren't real, and therefore we've never seen one, never, they're, they're still made of things that we have experienced, right? So it's a horse with a horn. So we've seen horses, we've seen animals with horns, so we've seen horns. Now all that we've done is we've combined them in a, in a way, in a novel way. So this, this thing is really nothing but just an elaboration, a, a novel set of associations and relationships between items that we already know through experience. And that's how we can explain imagination, is that every, every fantasy uh, and fictional character or monster or whatever that we've ever invented is nothing but a, an elaboration on those previous experiences. And this takes us to John Locke. John Locke is kind of the epitome of British empiricism in the same way that Plato is the epitome of Greek rationalism. Locke is the central figure in, in British empiricism here, one of the originators of it. So he's the one who gives us that blank slate, although there were others before him, especially Avicenna. Uh, but the white paper philosophy is another metaphor that I like from Locke. Again, the claim is uh, we, the, the mind is like a sheet of white paper when we are born, devoid of all characters, and the pen of experience writes upon it. So he's saying there's nothing that's innate. He's rejecting rationalism and making a strong empiricist claim, all knowledge from experience. But there's a little twist here to John Locke that complicates matters for us. Hobbes, as we saw, was trying to take British philosophy into the direction of materialism. But John Locke is preserving this dualism. If you recall from uh, previous chapters, chapter 3, Galileo gave us the distinction of primary and secondary qualities. And Locke is going to continue to use this. He's suggesting that there is uh, an awareness in the mind and there is a world out there. And he, do believes, or he does believe that those two things are connected to each other, that we are aware of an outside world, but he is maintaining this distinction between what's going on in the mind and what's going on out there in the world. And so, he said, again, to reemphasize what Galileo said, we have objects in the world as they exist, and they have certain kinds of properties, like they reflect light. But as Newton had shown, uh, light is not colored, right? Newton, with his experiments with prisms, was trying to argue that light, color, does not exist inside the light rays. It's not a property of the object. It's not a property of the light. It only emerges or arises inside our experience, inside our observations. So that's a secondary quality, right? So primary qualities would be objects as they exist. They reflect light. Secondary quality is the way we experience that property, which means in the mind, psychologically, it becomes color. Right. And this is knowledge, right? So, so Locke, in trying to generate a theory of human knowledge through experience, through perception, says that knowledge begins with these secondary qualities, that when light strikes the photoreceptors in the eye, we have these low-level visual sensations. Each receptor is, is responding to the brightness of the light and the wavelength of the light, which gives rise to uh, a ex psychological experience, a secondary quality of brightness and color. So there's dual, Locke is being a dualist instead of a materialist like, like Hobbes. Um, and this reminds us of that question, right? That, that, the famous philosophical question, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one around to hear it, does it make a sound? So if you're going to be a dualist like this, 
we are going to say sound is the secondary quality. It exists only in the mind. Primary quality for that would be a vibration, right? So when two things happen, here my, I'm going to clap my hands. What's going on here is that I'm compressing the air between my hands, and this causes a sudden increase in air pressure that travels through the, through the air, and the, the air molecules are vibrating as you get this traveling wave of high and low air pressure which makes it into your ear and that causes the eardrum to vibrate, it causes the, the bones in the ear to vibrate, it causes the basal membrane inside the cochlea to vibrate, it causes the hair cells to vibrate, it causes the auditory nerve to vibrate and so forth. But at some point these vibrations become the experience of sound and you hear a hand clapping. So that's Locke's basic idea here. Properties of perception are not really the same as properties of things in the world. There are things as they are, and then there are things as they are experienced, primary and secondary. And if knowledge begins with these secondary qualities or sensations, then we have to figure out what happens after that. And so here's Locke's theory of ideas. Where do ideas come from? Starts with a sensation. So again, the sensations are generally treated as the physical side of things. So the light striking the receptors and causing the receptors to respond in certain ways. But then psychologically we experience simple ideas. So for vision, those simple ideas would be things like brightness and color. One way to think about a simple idea is that it's an idea that cannot be broken down into anything simpler or smaller than itself. So if it, if it can be broken down, it's not a simple idea. Instead, it's a complex idea. So let's consider the, the example of a dog which we've talked about before. A dog is a complex idea because we know it consists of different kinds of things like Great Danes and German Shepherds and Poodles and Chihuahuas and whatnot. But let's take one of those, a German Shepherd. Is that a simple idea? And the answer here is no because we also know that we can take the idea of German Shepherd and we can break it down into components like the, the, the color of its fur, the black and brown colors, the texture of its fur, the, the shape of its, of its head and face and ears and so forth and its overall size. So we know that each one of those then, is that a complex idea? Well, let's consider one example, the, the, the brown color of its furs, brown. Can we break that down into anything simpler than that? And here we think maybe the answer is no. So we suddenly say, okay, what we're doing is we're analyzing knowledge. Right? We're analyzing these ideas. We're breaking them down into smaller and smaller bits and pieces until we come to a stop and I say I can't break it down anymore and this is where we say this is a simple idea and for Locke this is the foundation of all knowledge. Knowledge begins with the simple ideas because at the level of our sensory experience simple ideas are the first things that are created by an external sensory input. So looking at the German Shepherd and the first thing that happens is that light strikes the receptors in your eye and this gives you the simple ideas of the brown and black colors and the other basic uh, simple ideas that make up your overall visual impression, which all then have to come together somehow. All the simple ideas have to be combined. So now we're working back up. We're synthesizing, instead of analyzing, right, we're synthesizing these simple ideas into the complex idea. And that's how knowledge works in Locke's theory. And this synthesis occurs through this principle of association. Right? So the simple ideas become associated with each other. So all of the different the textures and the shapes and the sizes and the and the colors, all of those simple ideas become associated with each other and together that that total association is your recognition of the German Shepherd. Beyond that we can create further associations, right? So I can associate the complex idea of German Shepherd with the complex idea of a Great Dane and the complex idea of a Chihuahua. And all of those, those further associations, these higher level associations, represent our concept right, of dog. Dog as a category, dog as a concept, is just nothing but the associations we make between all of these different animals. So I think we're thinking nominalism here as well. Right? Remember, nominalism is the idea that the ideas that we have of the, of the universals, the generalities, the abstractions, are just, they're just associations that we make and the names that we give to those associations. And then we get another ism, associationism. Here we're basically saying that knowledge can be explained by the laws of association, by the principles that govern how associations occur in the mind. So all knowledge then 
comes from associations that are made. New ideas, new associations. We talked about unicorns earlier, so the basic idea here is that's just an association between a horse and a horn. Right? And all learning is just making new associations and making new ideas together to, to build more and more associations. And the more associations you create, the more you know, the more intelligent you are. And this takes us also then to association uh, and partly. So partly, I think, recognizes the problems of this discrepancy between between Hobbes and Locke. Right? He, I think, what I think what Hartley likes about John Locke is the idea of explaining knowledge through associations, building building up from from some simple ideas to complex ideas. And by the way, if you want to compare this to something in cognitive psychology or something else in another psychology class, you may have heard the term bottom-up processing, and this is exactly where that comes from. It begins with Locke's theory of ideas. All knowledge is built up from simple ideas to complex ideas. Right? As I said, it's a process of synthesis, building it up. So Hartley doesn't like though, the dualist side of things. I think from Hobbes, Hartley likes the, the, the epiphenomenalist, materialist uh, motion in the brain kind of stuff. So, so Hartley modifies the motions in the brain idea a little bit, and he replaces it with vibrations. Vibrations in the nerves, vibrations in the brain. So it's a nerve vibration of the senses, a vibration of the optic nerve for vision or the auditory nerve for hearing and any of the other senses. He calls these sense vibrations, which eventually trigger brain vibrations, which give rise to these simple ideas. And Hartley uses this word vibratiocal. I don't even know where he got it or what it's really meaning other than just a, it's, a, it's, it's a brain vibration that corresponds to an idea that we have. And he's invoking the law of contiguity, Locke and even going all the way back to Aristotle, we've talked about the law of contiguity, that when two, two things occur at the same time, especially two ideas, two simple ideas, two vibratiocals occur at the same time, they become linked together uh, because of that. So of course when you're looking at the German Shepherd, you simultaneously experience all of the many simple ideas, and through the law of contiguity, they become immediately associated and connected to, ge to generate the complex idea of German Shepherd. And Hartley has a, a, a an attempt to explain this by talking about how the, all of these simple ideas would have the same or common resonant frequency or fundamental frequency and therefore because they resonate with each other they are connected that way and that's how the, the vibrations all sort of sync up and connect to each other and become a larger thing. So he's just basically coming up with a essentially a, a neuro, neurological explanation or a mechanical explanation of Locke's theory of ideas so that we can take it back into the materialist view of things. Another one, James Mill is going to contribute to associationism here. Mill's ideas are referred to as mental physics. So again, there's a simple idea of synthesis, right? Of building ideas up, just like you're constructing something like a house. You're just building it with bricks, and you just pile the bricks together, and you get your, your whole thing. And that's almost exactly how James Mill views human knowledge, that all of these complex ideas are just built up out of simple bricks, and the simple bricks are the, are the simple ideas, and that it's a simple linear, easy to understand explanation of how knowledge begins. All, all knowledge is really nothing more than a list of the basic elements that compose it. Um, he also contributes to associationism by giving us the concept of the strength of the association. The idea is that two ideas are associated with each other, whether those are two simple ideas or two complex ideas, but the idea is that some of those associations can be weak, others may be strong. Right? So if you think about, you know, if you think of one thing, it might remind you of another thing, and that's because of the association between them. But we would also have to think, well, why is it that that is triggered? How come I'm more likely to think of one thing than another? Because there are different strengths of associations between ideas. Mills gives us two principles to explain the strength of association. So vividness is one. Here, the idea is that when two things are very vivid or salient, or very noticeable, you're more likely to associate them. 
So perhaps when you are looking at a person's face and you begin to experience the simple ideas that will build up to your awareness of their, of their eyes or something like that, the more vivid aspects of their, of their face, the eyes, the nose, the mouth, those will become much more vividly connected with each other and stronger associations are formed. This can also explain other things like emotional memories or flashbulb memories where you're, you know, if you, some kind of major event occurs, you tend to be able to remember exactly where you were and what you were doing when that happened because the major event is so salient, so vivid, that it becomes strongly connected with everything else that was going on uh, because of that vividness. Frequency means repetition, right? So the more, more frequently an association is experienced, the more frequently you see the same person over and over again, for example, the easier it becomes to remember their face, right? Of course, this is later demonstrated scientifically because Pavlov, right? Uh, in this case, the idea is that when Pavlov was training his dogs to salivate in response to a, a tone or a click, um, they don't do that right off the bat, right? It's, but that's learning by association. They eventually, they learn the association between the auditory stimulus and, and food, which causes salivation in response to the, to the auditory stimulus. Um, so it's a form of association learning, right? So again, behaviorism is going to become the, the modern scientific version of all of this philosophy. Uh, but it doesn't happen on trial one. You might have to repeat this pairing a dozen times before the dogs begin to salivate. And so that's the principle of frequency. And, and enough frequent repetitions of this pairing will cause the, the association to get strong enough to trigger the response. And then we get John Stuart Mill, the son of James Mill. Now, he has some, some, some ideas about associationism that are a little different from his father. But before we talk about that, let's do a little bit of biographical stuff about John Stuart Mill. We haven't done a lot of biography stuff in this class, but this is a little relevant and, and kind of gives us some good context here. So I'm saying here that John Stuart Mill could be one, among the first of what we might think of as the child of a behaviorist. Because, again, I'm comparing this British empiricist movement to, to later behaviorism. And so if you think about this, what I said earlier is that all, if, if all knowledge can be explained by associations between ideas that we have experienced, then the idea is that the more experiences that you have and the more associations that you make, the more you will know, the more intelligent you will be. And that seems to have been the approach that James Mill had in raising John Stuart Mill is to expose him at a very early age to a lot of information. Enough that we know that he was quite uh, quite uh, intelligent, and and um, so you know, showing here that he knew not just his primary language of English, but Greek and Latin in childhood, uh, proficient with algebra, logic, and other mathematics. But curiously enough, also wrote in his adult years uh, about his struggles with uh, problems that we would nowadays label as what appeared to have been major depression. And, and so if we think, you know, part of the aspect of associationistic learning is that it's, it, it involves passivity, right? We don't have free will. Uh, we are at the mercy of our experiences, right? And, and so the idea is that you just you receive a, sense, a stimulus and then your response is not chosen freely. It is just governed through, through, through associations. So when you apply this to child rearing and education, you would say that children should be passive. They should sit and be exposed to as much information as you can throw at them, and that's going to expand their minds and build them up with all the knowledge that they have. So we would suggest that it wasn't necessarily just the, the exposure to all of this education in childhood that was problematic for John Stuart Mill, but actually the nature of its presentation, which was he was perhaps meant to be passive and quiet and obedient and never allowed to do things for himself and have more active role in his education. And the whole idea of the child of a behaviorist is relevant here because when we get to that chapter, we're going to look at uh, the two most key and famous behaviorists, John Watson and B.F. Skinner. But there have been things written about their children as well. Watson followed the Pavlovian approach of classical conditioning, passive association learning. Watson's sons ended up depressed as well. 
Skinner, on the other hand, had a very different kind of approach to behavioristic learning. He, he, was, he focused on operant learning, where the animal or child does something first, more active, and then there's a consequence, a reinforcement or a punishment. So Skinner, in his approach to his own family, used reinforcement rather than passive learning, uh, active reinforcement learning. And his daughters uh, were noted to have been actually quite happy and healthy and well-adjusted as they grew up. So some interesting implications for thinking about these ideas in both philosophy and psychology and, and, and their application. Back to J.S. Mill's philosophy here. He's famous, most famous, for his utilitarian philosophies, but for, for our purposes, we'll focus on his mental chemistry argument. He says that separately from what his father said, that knowledge is simple building up like building blocks, building brick by brick to create something, he says that a complex idea is actually more than just the sum of the simple ideas. It's kind of like a chemical reaction. So the idea is that when you have a chemical reaction, there are these fundamental changes occurring in the molecular bonds between things, and the new chemical or compound that you get out of a reaction cannot be easily explained as just a simple combination of whatever elements went into it. It has the properties that exist only at that, that, at that new level, that can't be explained by properties of the other elements, right? So he calls this then mental chemistry, that complex ideas have properties that simple ideas don't. Right? Uh, the whole, it sounds like the whole is more than the sum of its parts, right? And we know that phrase from Gestalt psychology. And I don't want to give the impression that John Stuart Mill may have had a direct influence on Gestalt psychology because they followed a very different, more continental European uh, influence, but similar sentiments here. And the last major association is, is Alexander Bain, who importantly gets us well into the 1800s and whose life overlapped that of Ivan Pavlov. It's not clear how much of an obvious direct uh, influence there was between Bain and Pavlov, but Bain basically is, is getting us into this more modern era. And um, so Bain is suggesting, for example, that this whole idea of the law of contiguity, that uh, you know, see two things at the same time and we link them together, that, go, that, that applies not just to simple ideas, but it can apply to complex ideas as well. When two, two complex ideas happen at the same time, an association is formed. He says, basically, we've got this broad law of association that any idea, thought, or action can be associated with any other one that occurs at the same time. He also gives us the law of compound association, which says that associations are not singular. It's not one idea connected to one idea. It's one idea can be connected to any number of other ideas. And so if we think about how all of the ideas in the mind are interconnected with each other in complex ways, in modern cognitive psychology, we use terms like a, a, a semantic network to explain the complexity of the interconnections between all of the ideas that we have and the concepts that we know. Uh, that's what Bain calls compound association. And then he also explains imagination and fiction and fantasy, as before, uh, as constructive association, right? flexible thinking, creative thinking, and so forth, that we can create new associations in our mind that go beyond what we have experienced. And I'm going to pause it here, because this is getting to be a long recording, and I want to uh, give, give you a, a break to digest all of this material and make the file a little bit smaller, but also we're going in a very different direction for the second half of these notes.